Hello to you all and welcome to Tasks Engaged, the first of, uh, of a series of webinars done by Tasks Technology Group, as well as its subsidiaries, Tasks Distribution and Tasks On Demand. My name is Senzo Mbele and I'll be your host for the hour. Apologies for the slight delay, we just had some connectivity issues. Um, yeah, we do apologize. We'll do our best to honor your diaries and to be finished um, within the time that's allocated for the day. Um, thank you again for joining us today um, for what is the first um, of this, this series that I've already mentioned. Um, today's session is um, titled Unprecedented Precedence, and I've got two guests um, that I'll introduce to you shortly. It is our hope at Tarsus that you might find today's session and the ones that will follow later on um, in the year, in, in the year and, and months to come, that you'll find them firstly inspirational, that you'll also find them in, in, encouraging, um, and, and particularly today that you might find insights that may be useful for you, for your families, for your friends as well. Um, I believe that these insights are particularly apt at this time when we are living in, in unprecedented times um, and times where environment is, is continuously changing. For me personally, I found it that it's been quite a bit of a shake up personally and professionally and it's my professional life, my personal life has just collided. Um, and uh, as I've already said, we've got two gentlemen, um, one sitting socially distanced next to me, Miles Crisp, uh, I'll introduce him shortly, and Dr. Rulof Porter is joining us uh, virtually. Um, just to introduce to you Miles Crisp, he is the CEO of Tarsus Technology Group, as well as the, the subsidiary Tarsus Distribution. He is a chartered accountant by training. Uh, he's been in, 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 in a professional life and been working for more than four decades in various industries from financial services to professional um, services, um, direct sales, and lately in, in supply chain services and IT logistics and distribution. He is absolutely passionate about um, the development of young leaders. He rolls up his sleeves and he mentors a number of young people to see them thrive and succeed um, well into their careers. He's also an avid mountain biker. I'm pretty sure, Miles, you've got a few ribs that, can, that don't like the fact that you do that. So welcome today, Miles. Thank you. Our guest presenter today is Dr. Rulof Boita. Uh, he's an economist by training. His career also spans more than four decades. It is littered with accolades and vast experience across numerous industries, sectors, and also types of companies. Um, his roles that he's held over the years include um, economic policy advisor at National Treasury, financial editor of a daily newspaper, senior lecturer at, at numerous universities, uh, chief economist of the South African Federated Chamber of Industries. He is currently the economic advisor to the Optimum Investment Group and authors five different columns in national and regional publications. If if all of that that I've mentioned does not qualify him as uh, the right person to speak to us today as we look ahead, I think that the fact that he has accurately predicted a number of events um, based on facts uh, uh, qualifies him, particularly the fact that he, he predicted that Amapogopo would bring back the Web Ellis Cup um, uh, uh, last year. Uh, he will help us shape how we could potentially respond to these times while we are mindful of the future. Before I hand over to him, I just want to say that um, in, in my culture, Sizulu, we, I'm sure you've all seen when, when the president is about to do the State of the Nation address and there's the praise singer who goes before him. When the praise singer finishes, they will either say, or they will say, uh, what that basically means, this is your Zulu lesson for the day. What that basically means is the, 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 the experiences and the successes and the credentials of the person I've introduced are so much that I don't have enough time to say them all. So I'm saying of Dr. Puerta and Miles that uh, I don't have all the time to introduce them today, but I assure you they are qualified to chat to us today. Um, and uh, I want to encourage you uh, who have joined us, and I see that there are a few people who are still joining us. Um, I, I want to encourage you to engage um, on, in, the, in the section below um, to, to pose any questions, any comments, and any thoughts. And we'll answer as many of these questions as we can and, um, um, today. And if we don't get to it today, we'll find a way to respond to those in the next coming days. I'm going to now hand over to Dr. Bortha. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind of introduction. Um, <clears throat> I also have uh, four children and uh, seven grandchildren, so I haven't just been studying. <laughs> and I'm, the, <laughs> I'm the only economist in this country, and this is a fact, that has provincial honors in sport parachuting. Uh, and the reason I mention this is that I don't scare easy. Uh, I was asked on, on a live radio yesterday to comment on the EFF's um, intention to table a bill in Parliament. <laughs> if you've only got 10% of the seats, there's not much of a chance you're going to get a bill passed through um, to nationalize the Reserve Bank. I mean, the timing is just pathetic. But what would you expect uh, from a bunch of guys like that? Uh, the word nationalization um, is a dangerous word in these days, and we must try to avoid that at all costs as far as I'm concerned. You know the definition of a communist, don't you? Uh, a, a communist is somebody who, who's got nothing, but he wants to share it with you. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I don't think we should be scared of, uh, of that uh, type of nonsense. Uh, I'm going to get uh, right on here with my slides and bring in my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, put it on presentation mode. And I hope everybody can see that. Uh, yep. So w what I intend doing is just run through a couple of themes. And I like to believe that I will preempt quite a number of questions. So if you if you can just follow the slides carefully, they, they, uh, most of them are time series data. It's all based on fact. My opinion is always based on fact. Um, I'm convinced that some of the questions that you may have in your minds uh, would be answered as we go along. And I'm going to start right away uh, with the bad news. But just before I get there, I just want to tell you that uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Optimum Investment Group for more than one reason, apart from uh, um, being their advisor. Uh, and that is that I shifted my UJ in, in the old days of the Sarant Afrikaans University pension to them a, a, a year or so ago. And they did a backtesting model. And if I'd done that earlier, uh, three years earlier, I would have had half a million bucks more in my pocket today. <laughs> So thanks uh, for these guys, what they're doing with my money right now. I always tell the joke, and it's actually uh, probably pretty close to reality, that if I win the lotto tomorrow, what I do is two things. I would um, buy myself, um, well, three things, actually. I buy myself a Ford Mustang V8, even if I only listen to the engine from time to time. Uh, that will go hand in hand with a good divorce lawyer. Um, and then the rest of the money I'll give to Francois Buerta at Optimum, no relation of mine. He knows what to do with that stuff. But getting on to more serious stuff, uh, when this thing hit us, uh, by the way, that's the Zimbabwean economy in the background. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. But they've got serious problems. Why? Because of nationalization. And, and uh, if there's anybody here uh, that has the ear of uh, the Parliamentary Standing Committee that must decide on this radical land reform, I hope they're, they're, they're making some notes. So uh, we know what happened to the long-term bond yield. Just for the viewer's benefit, if a country's long-term bond, bond yield increases, it means the value of the bond is declining. Nobody wants to buy the stuff anymore. And when that thing was heading towards 13, 14, uh, I was on a live radio show with uh, several other economists, and they were talking, some of them were talking 15, telling people to get your money out of the country and nonsense like that. And I predicted within four months, we'll have a 300 basis point decline in the bond yield, and it was such an easy one to call because this is not a banana republic. We are not a failed state. We are one of the 35 largest economies in the world. We are the pivotal economy on this continent. Uh, and our per capita GDP in this country has been rising relentlessly. It did a bit of a, a serious speed wobble during the Zuma administration, but let's not uh, dwell on that too much. And there, voila, it happened. That was quite an easy one to call. I don't always get it right, but when I do, I try to tell as many people as possible. Um, there, there's another um, dilemma we had, and that's the exchange rate. As we know, when this thing was heading towards, uh, it was over 19, uh, on a different um, uh, radio survey, the predictions were crazy. I don't even want to mention them. Uh, it's like a horror movie. Uh, and, and my... Best estimate at the time was that by year end, we should be a hell of a lot closer to 16 than to 20. Uh, and I think I'm going to get that one right as well. By the way, this is the value of a dollar that you see on this slide. If you calculate the reciprocal, the value of a rand, 
and um, depending on, on uh, the time uh, series data down here, you'll see a V. And if I can just go back quickly to this slide. Um, so the reciprocal of this would be the value of our bonds. There's another V and, and that uh, we could have had a bit of a competition, uh, uh, Miles and Senzo, uh, for the viewers, spot the Vs. There are many of them. It's my favorite letter right now. This is not my favorite V. This is government uh, debt GDP ratio uh, and it's increasing relentlessly. We know it's going to, it's heading towards 80%. So let's have a pre-COVID look at where we are compared to our <clears throat> peers and major, major trading partners. We are not out of sync and you can add between 10 and 20 percentage points to each one of these countries public debt GDP ratio. So what uh, do we need to do? Um, if you look at the heading, it says public debt divided by GDP. So we have a denominator. So countries that are fortunate enough to have some form of control over their public debt, as we have, uh, unless there's a pandemic, of course, then things go haywire a little bit. But after this is passed, we will have quite a large measure of control over what the size of our public debt is in the short to medium term, at least. That is the secret, the denominator, because the minute you start growing your economy and the public debt is relatively stable, at least for a while, then the sum uh, starts shrinking. And that's what we need to concentrate on. And that's why it's not surprising that President Ramaphosa, Mr. Tito Mbaweni, why they are placing the focus now on economic growth and job creation. We should put the ideological objectives on the back burner just for a while, as far as I'm concerned. It has been said that Vasco da Gama, those of you that um, know the history of this part of the world, was the first public sector economist in this part of the world because he found himself at a place where he didn't know where he was. He didn't know where he was going to, but government was paying for it. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like home affairs, doesn't it? Um, our debt servicing cost is not out of sync either, so that's not a serious problem at this stage. Um, our public debt situation currently is one which every country in the world is grappling with, and every country in the world, quite frankly, knows that we have to start growing our economies, and that's what, they, what they're doing, and it's already starting. The, the, the recovery has already progressed further than most people realize. So uh, what my research team and I did in the initial stages of the lockdown is to look at which sectors would, would actually be leading sectors as we come out of the post pandemic. Some of them never went into decline. Um, Vodafone, Vodafone, a well-known international company, they've had to, they were forced to bring forward a, a hell of a lot of capital expenditure aimed at uh, announcing their infrastructure for telecommunication. Um, if you look at um, some of these online trading platforms, uh, some of our metals and minerals have been doing exceptionally well. I don't, uh, we can mention gold if we want to. And this is important for um, a company like uh, Tarsus and his, its supply chain is to, is to understand uh, if, if you have a client, a company, uh, where do they fit in? Are they in the leading sectors? Are they in the lagging sectors? Or are, in the, are they in the sectors that are lagging a hell of a lot, like uh, civil aviation uh, and hospitality? It's going to take a while, but it will get there. I think Kruger National Park's website has crashed. <laughs> Everybody wants to see some, some lions uh, for a change. And here you can see the, the, some of the structural shifts that have occurred, but there will be a retracement of this as we move into the future. So if you look at Uber's uh, revenues um, in, in the second quarter of this year, uh, that's the brown bar, and you compare that to the second quarter of last year, there was a decline of 75%. Uber Eats, an increase of more than 100%. Whereas Eats was a quarter of uh, the, the rides, now it's double that. But there will be a retracement of this. But once again, uh, I, I think some cheer that we can take out of this is that Economies have not, have not ground to a halt. There, there is a hell of a lot of economic activity that occurred during lockdown. And obviously now that lockdown is more or less on its way out, uh, we are rapidly getting back to normal and you can spot the Vs uh, as we go along. I'll get to some of them uh, as we go along. I mean, obviously these companies are well known to all of us. Um, and just look what happened to their revenues. Uh, they've had spectacular revenue growth in the first half of this year. Um, and, and uh, the words we're looking for is not despite COVID, it's <laughs> to some extent because of COVID. 
So and now, and, and following, uh, you know, the passing of this pandemic, companies will have to reassess whether they are in the right sectors, whether they need to diversify or whether they need to um, amalgamate and, and concentrate more on, on their uh, key skills. Uh, I believe Home Affairs here in Pretoria has opened again. Uh, when Mr. Gigaba was still the minister, he was once asked um, when there was an international delegation visiting him in this lovely building of theirs, uh, granite clad on the exterior, uh, I think about 15 lifts and dozens, hundreds of people, you know, all around. It's quite a buzz of activity. They were, he was asked how many people work here. And he thought for a while, he said about half of them, but he may have been exaggerating as he is wont to do. Um, right, short term insurance um, snapshot. Uh, I, I thought I'd bring this in. I don't think any viewer uh, today does not have short term insurance. Uh, and it, it's, uh, we need to start looking at industries, uh, at the trends that were in place before this pandemic. Um, there, there was this, this terrible crash, V-shaped recovery for virtually every sector outside of aviation, outside of hospitality and a couple of others, obviously. And if you look at the trends as far as um, uh, short-term insurance indicators are concerned, it's, it's a, uh, always a good barometer of what's going on in your economy. You can clearly see uh, a rising trend. Uh, other short-term insurance premiums received, this is now not for reinsurance. I mean, this is not a bad industry to be in. Uh, they will take a bit of a knock now, but that will pass pretty soon as far as I'm concerned. And people in surveys that have been conducted by Old Mutual, for instance, uh, has clearly shown that cancelling your insurance policy long term or short term is very low on your list. You're going to eat out less, make no mistake about that, uh, and, and, and cut on some luxuries. But you, you are not going, you're going to postpone buying a new car, perhaps, to some extent, but you're not going to cut down on your insurance, especially not in a country uh, with, with our uh, crime rate. Um, your domestic current account surplus, income surplus of short-term insurance industries, uh, companies are, uh, it's pretty solid. They also declare a lot of um, dividends. Investment income is predictably uh, volatile because of uh, dividend payments, which occur twice a year and uh, this year, <laughs> uh, not so much for many companies, unless you're in resources. Um, thank you very much, Kumba. Uh, anybody from Kumba listening, uh, thank you very much. I, I, at least I got one dividend uh, on my little share portfolio. Um, and the ratio of uh, premiums received to claims paid, if you look at reinsurance with the other insurance, pretty boring reinsurance, uh, you need some, some guts to be in that, uh, in that game, obviously, because you're taking uh, on extra risks. Okay, I want to move on to, um, this is the slide that I was referring to. Uh, Old Mutual did uh, uh, research and, and it was a very impressive sample size. Percentage of spending that may stay the same or increase post COVID. Um, now, obviously the reciprocal of this would be the percentage of spending that will, is inclined to, to decrease. So, so there you can see it, medical aid, car and household insurance, education, those are obviously priority areas. Food, <laughs> obviously there's no substitute for food. You can't eat uh, your computer, uh, etc. So you go, go down the line. And obviously these industries at the bottom will take longer to, to recover, but they will recover. I think that's the important issue is that they will recover. Um, and we can see the recovery everywhere. There's another V. I never thought I would be pleased to see the oil price increasing. Um, a, a friend of mine told me the other day, said, Rolf, you know, um, a recession is, is worse than a divorce because you also lose half your fortune, but you're still married, uh, which I find a little bit cynical uh, personally. So there's another V. That means the world economy is clearly starting to grow again. And this is one of my favorite slides. <clears throat> now, if I'd gone to the trouble of including March's PMI figures here, uh, that's the Purchasing Managers Index. Just for the viewer's benefit, if you don't know this, the uh, red line at 50 there, the horizontal line, that's the border between expansion, economic expansion and economic contraction. So below that line, your economy is not growing. Above that line, your economy is growing. And this includes manufacturing and services. So in the case of the United States, we're talking about 96, 97% of total GDP. Uh, and that's more or less the same for most of these other countries as well. 
and if I'd included March's PMI figures, you would have seen a V, a very pronounced V, an extremely pronounced V for every single one of these countries and for virtually every country in the world, except perhaps Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Why? Because of nationalization. Uh, it's another word for stealing, by the way. And what we see here is, except for Japan, which is a little bit slow, uh, it's, it's a fairly lethargic economy over the last 20 years, but they will also go to 50 shortly. But all the others are already at, already at 50 or above. So uh, this is not debatable, whether we are experiencing a V-shaped recovery. It has already happened. It, it lies in the past. Uh, what we need to start talking about now is how fast these leading sectors will expand and how fast the, the new kids on the block, which, which have uh, come to the party as a result of the fourth industrial revolution, having been thrust upon us now, how quickly they will expand. You are going to see companies now growing at the same rate as some of the companies on the NASDAQ, which has been on an all-time record high for quite a while, despite COVID, actually as a result of COVID. Uh, and there, this is the most pronounced V that, that you can find. The, the Chinese PMI, of course, they were a couple of months earlier than we, we were one month just one month, and, and they, they're going again. Uh, your global GDP forecasts, if I'd gone to the trouble, the slide gets a little bit too busy, but if you can just imagine that we put in 2019's actual figures here, which were above the line for all of these countries, then you see another V for every one of these countries. Not in the history of the IMF has there been such a large spread between one year's growth forecasts and the next year's. But I. I think it's time that we start concentrating on those bars, those burgundy bars above the line, because that's what's waiting for us next year and the foundation is being laid as, we as we're speaking. Uh, South African perspective, agriculture. I just want to say something about agriculture. If you look at this declining gap between agriculture's share of fixed capital stock and their share of GDP, clearly that declining gap means that this is a very productive sector. You can see that uh, for instance, in virtually every, any crop or product that you can think of, commodity in agriculture. The yields just keep on increasing despite areas being planted uh, declining. That is a bit of a concern uh, and that has a hell of a lot to do with uh, the fears of uh, radical land transformation. Obviously, we need land reform in South Africa, but we need, we need to do this sensibly. And we can do it sensibly because government owns 22 million hectares of this beautiful country. That's one fifth. And I can guarantee you a hell of a lot of that properties of that property is lying idle and fallow. Um, in that movie out of Africa towards the end when she went back to Scandinavia, this, this uh, lady that uh, was the main actress, uh, there was a scene where she's at the subway station and somebody scribbled there, I had a farm in Africa. And somebody else scribbled underneath that, you're lucky, I still have mine. But that depends where your farm is, of course. Uh, you can see it with virtually ev any crop, avos, bananas took a bit of a dip, uh, sugar cane doing very well, our orange exports, um, South African oranges are uh, the best in the world. I don't think we need to debate that. Look at agriculture's export performance. Next to vehicles, the number one generator of forex for this country in the first quarter. And one of the reasons why we have a current account surplus for the first time in 17 years. And here you can see that growing gap between exports and imports. And the bulk of our agriculture and food exports goes to sub-Saharan Africa. And I've got no doubt in my mind that some of these African leaders would have whispered in Mr. President Ramaphosa's ear, don't mess with South Africa's farmers because they are feeding us. Uh, and it's okay, you know, if people are disgruntled and about service delivery, that's one thing. But if they're hungry as well, then you are going to have huge, huge problems. Um, the RAND, this um, research is sponsored by Currencies Direct. If you ever want to take the hassle out of Forex transactions, I, I can strongly recommend that you contact these guys. Graham Barrett, Abel Skuman and his crowd down there in Cape Town. They've got offices throughout the country. Um, they are extremely professional, part of a global group, of course, head office in London. Um, now, what we do, what I do for them on a monthly basis is to calculate the real effective exchange rate of the RAND, which tells you by how much the RAND is undervalued from where it, it should be. And currently that is about 24%. 
So why would you want to take your money out of the country <laughs> if your currency uh, is 24% undervalued and you have every chance under the new leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa of fixing this economy over the next couple of years? Because remember, President Zuma and his cohorts systematically eroded and decimated the e efficiency and effectiveness of the public sector at large in this country. And if you don't believe me, wait for the next load shedding, right? Uh, and, and, or listen to the Zono Commission or read some of the Auditor General reports. Trevor Manuel, for whom I have a hell of a lot of respect, is on record for saying the worst disaster ever to hit this country in our entire history was Jacob Zuma and of course, some other people that he appointed. Now, Mr. Zuma thinks it's Jan van Riebeek, but I must strongly disagree with him on that one. So the rand is undervalued. Now, interesting, let's just go back a little bit to, to Zupta Gate. There you had Ramaphoria. So the rand was on its way back to the red line where it's supposed to be. And that's probably about 13 rand to the dollar. And then the trade war and COVID hit us. Point I want to make is that if Mr. Mboweni's new growth plan works, and I'd like to believe it will, not overnight, but it will work in the next couple of years, then the RAND will be heading back to that red line. Just uh, uh, an important uh, maybe tip to those of you that do dabble with forex from time to time. The services sectors are just rising relentlessly in comparison to the rest. And this is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why we have a V-shaped recovery. Because in South Africa's case, almost 70%, in the case of the US, 80%, 80% of the economy is services related. And 90% of the people that lost their jobs in America as a result of COVID have got them back. And in the interim, they had unemployment insurance. So it is as if the cynics, cynics just got onto a wagon and you know they were just enjoying themselves terribly. It's been said that a pure optimist believes we live in the best of all possible worlds and a pure pessimist fears this is true. But we are getting out of this. Okay, now I'm, I'm not naive. Um, household disposable income per capita in South Africa this year will decline. It will decline in real terms. It will be decline in nominal terms for the first time in 30 years. But that will be a small decline, probably not more than 34% max. Um, more positive stuff or just nice to know stuff. Our average formal sector salary in South Africa is uh, more than a quarter of a million rand a year. <coughs> <laughs> the guys and girls at ESCOM, <laughs> they earn double. Uh, not a good idea, as far as I'm concerned. Renewables, here we come. Uh, and that's another growth driver in the next couple of years. There's our first current account surplus in 17 years. Uh, also as a result of a structural increase in our ratio of foreign income receipts to foreign income payments. Uh, there you can see another V, by the way. Uh, there, there are so many structural improvements to our, that have taken place in this economy that, that took a bit of a beating during the, the last uh, decade. Uh, Trevor Manion was quoted out of, he was quoted literally wrongly. He, he was speaking about a lost decade, not a lost three decades. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he was Minister of Finance, this country had a budget surplus. We had a budget surplus. So uh, why, why would he say, you know, that we got things wrong? If, if we had a budget surplus. Um, and this is a very interesting slide. So stats, <coughs> well, they told us that we had, we were in a recession in the first quarter. Uh, now, if you are going to go into recession as we will in the second quarter, and that data will come out in about two weeks time, less than two weeks time, and it'll be shocking stuff. It'll be an unbelievable record decline. We all know that if you, if you close your economy, literally close it for a month, then how, uh, how are you not going to have a recession in that quarter? But when, if they tell us we're in a recession, when we're not in a recession yet. That is really very frustrating for an economist. So I took our gross national product. I, I deflated that by the CPI. And that gave me a 3.6%, 3.6% real annualized increase in gross national product. And what this slide actually tells you is that we were on our way we were on our way to significantly higher GDP growth before COVID hit us. And of course, COVID is on its way out. Slowly but surely, there's another V, mineral sales. Our mineral sales in the first six months of this year was only marginally short 
of the all-time record for the first six months, which was recorded last year. Uh, and mining has been one of our mainstays. Uh, retail trade sales, another v, another V. And interestingly enough, if you isolate general dealers, which is about half of total retail trade sales, and that's the most reliable sector or group of retail trade sales, because that includes the, the big guns, you know, the woolies, the pick and pays, et cetera, and data is more reliable than for the rest. Then June's general dealer retail trade sales was 2% higher than June last year. So, you know, if you know of somebody that doesn't believe that we are getting out of this recession, this recession, please send them to me. I'll eat them for breakfast. Um, there's another V, the JSE. Uh, why would you want to take your money out of the country? If you look at our blue chip shares in South Africa, the current PE ratios at record lows, dividend yields at record highs, but of course, um, that's only if they pay a dividend. So we're going to have to be a bit patient with some of these companies. Uh, and of course, the cherry on top of the cake, the lowest interest rate in 50 years, um, and inflation totally under control. If the Reserve Bank was really smart, it would tell South Africa, we will keep rates low for at least, at least two to three years. They won't move much from their current levels because inflation is not our problem. A demand efficiency is our problem. Unemployment is our problem. And what lower interest rates mean, of course, is that uh, durable consumption will start increasing. There's a predictable inverse relationship between lending rates and uh, durable and even semi-durable consumption. Um, my son, my middle son has a million rand bond on his house. From January till now, he has now 3,000 rand a month more in his pocket. And I know him, he's not going to save it. He's going to spend it. Um, you, you have the potential of about 120 billion rand uh, of, of additional uh, consumption demand that can come into the equation as a result of lower interest rates. Do not underestimate the power of lower interest rates. Uh, we ran an econometric model. I've always wanted to know what our economy would have been the size of the economy today if it hadn't been for the fact that after Jill Marcus's retirement, more or less over here in 2015, when she maintained an average real prime of 3%, that's now the prime overdraft rate minus CPI, it was on average 3% during Jill Marcus's tenure as governor of the Reserve Bank, best governor we ever had by a long shot, well, except for Tito. Uh, and then uh, she retired and Mr. Zuma appointed a new monetary policy committee. And for some uh, bizarre reason, they decided, uh, economic growth is not important. Let's try to get inflation down to zero. Very bad idea. So they took the average real prime rate to 5.3%. And we ran the economic model at UJ and our economy would have been 560 billion rand larger today than it is if we had stuck to the same uh, good monetary policy as far as I'm concerned. So now with low interest rates, that is going to be one of our key drivers. Just to finish off with some trivia, these are the 20 most innovating companies in the world. I promised Senzo a surprise. Uh, I think you will um, recognize a certain company there that you're associated with. Um, and not all of them are in IT, by the way. That's an interesting point. And I don't have to tell you that companies that like these, um, uh, and you'll find dozens of them on the NASDAQ, have a, a, an incredible future in, ahead of them in the next couple of years, and also uh, companies in their supply chains. Um, this is an interesting slide, just some trivia. We are one of the few countries that spends more on alcohol. <laughs> than on education. <laughs> so uh, perhaps they, we need a rethink on that one uh, for the longer term. Uh, some trivia questions. Where was the first heart transplant performed? I think you all know. Um, how many countries are classified as mega diverse? To best my knowledge, seven, and South Africa is one of them. Where is the only milk plant to have managed matched Stuttgart's technical production standards? Um, obviously, East London in South Africa. By the way, for all the German viewers, congratulations to Bayern Munich. The only thing wrong with Bayern is that they're not in Stuttgart. Uh, you probably recognize I'm a Merck fan. Which country achieved the highest score for scientific capability in the wording of the SKA project? We outperformed Australia by one hell of a margin. 
And I've been told that uh, this migration of South Africans to Australia has had a beneficial effect on the world labor market because it has increased the average IQ of both countries. Um, what was the nat nationality of the engineer that designed the world's most effective method of breakwater protection? It's called the DOLOS. You can see it at uh, Radisson at, at next to the VNA. Uh, it was a Mr. Kruger from uh, East London, actually. And he's, he passed away a couple of years ago. Brilliant, man. Where is the world's largest wine cellar located? <laughs> Starts with a P, Poly on Schamperl too. Uh, and which country has the most official languages in the world? That would also be us. So we've got a hell of a lot to be proud of. Uh, oh, and the one I called correctly, which country's rugby team has the best World Cup record in terms of uh, competitions that you actually played in and having won? And if there are any New Zealanders, toughies. Uh, I'm just about finished. Uh, there's always the talk about income inequality and income inequality exists all over the world as we are fully aware of. So what happened in South Africa um, in the last um, uh, you know, you know, uh, decade or longer? Uh, if you look uh, group people in terms of no income, low income, middle and upper income, there you have declines, which is fantastic. And there you have increases, which is equally fantastic. And I can guarantee you that if Mr. Ramaphosa is serious about deregulation, if he's serious about the infrastructure projects, and I like to believe he is, and we can get back to 3 4% growth next year. And by the way, the consensus amongst the 38 economists that participate in the Economist of the Year competition, which I happen to have won, is for 3.1% real growth next year. I think it, should be, it could uh, well be a lot higher. Then this trend will continue. Um, these are global competitive indicators for which South Africa enjoys a ranking in the top quintile in the world. Uh, and, and what is interesting about this is that these uh, indicators are spread throughout all the pillars of competitiveness. It's not just because we have oil like Nigeria. Uh, I mean, what a hopeless uh, place to be as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they, they are marginally uh, bigger than we are in terms of their total GDP, but I don't know many people that want to immigrate to Lagos, quite frankly. Uh, so we, we have places to go if we just get the policy right. And I must emphasize this. Venezuela and Zimbabwe did not become failed states in, with desperate poverty, with, with the societies in chaos, with literally, literally millions of people leaving those countries because they are dying of hunger. They did not become failed states because of a lack of opportunity or resources, they became failed states because of the wrong policies, policies of nationalization. You must allow the free market and free enterprise to run your economy, to drive your economy in partnership. And that's what I like to believe Mr. Ramaphosa wants to do. And hopefully he will get that message across to the naysayers in his cabinet because there are still some of them around. I wish he would get rid of them pronto. My last slide, our growth forecast for next year, including optimums as well, compared to the forecasts for this year. Uh, once again, if I put in 2019's actual figures, V, Vs, all along, Vs, we must start concentrating on those green lines. And the timing is, is right because it's spring. Things are starting to grow. Uh, we are looking forward apparently to good spring and summer rains in South Africa. We're looking, for the second, looking at the second largest maize crop in our history. There are so many things going for us. Let's put, start putting COVID behind us and look to the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pertha. That is um, a lot to mull over the weekend. It will certainly take probably the whole weekend to, to think through. Just, uh, I think while the doc probably grabbed a sip of water, Miles, I'm going to bring you in here and just ask, um, with everything that we've heard here, I mean, um, in your space, you're dealing a lot with uh, a lot of what's been discussed here from, from, from the strength of the RAND to the ZAR dollar exchange to, to innovation with, with some of the brands that we, global brands that we deal with. If you take it all into, into, into the basket or a boikie of some sort and, 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 uh, and you say, this is what everything that Dr. Portha has mentioned, this is what it means for us in the private sector. What would that be? And, and maybe just speak more specifically to, to the industry that, that, that Tarsus is in. 
Yeah, thanks, Senzo, and thanks everybody who's uh, who's tuned in, and thanks, Doc Butter, for um, for for just reminding us that there's life after COVID, and that this is a V, and that we need to start looking forward, and and also um, tap into the optimism that that is natural. Um, economies also are driven by sentiment, and I think you know the business confidence, the the whole area of people generally feeling pessimistic and feeling the pinch and, uh, and, and, and moping and feeling sorry for themselves and so on. It is, I think, Doc Boerter, you've reminded us that we need to lift our heads and look a little further ahead now and that this growth is coming um, and, and we need to gear for it. So, so I think, Senza, what, what I would comment on is, is that my overwhelming experience and that of Tarsus at the moment is that what COVID and the lockdown has done for us, it has just vastly accelerated all the change that was happening. We've personally, you know, in our business experienced just a, 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 an acceleration of changes that we've been very cautiously putting in place for a long time. And the new environment forced us to take the chance and to take the risk. It forced us to trust our people just to get on with this change. So all of these variations like wild swings in, in exchange rate, um, like waiting also for government um, to do something first around regulation and give these signals and so on. And I'm not suggesting that we recklessly blunder ahead and don't make plans. But one thing is for sure is that if we back ourselves and we back our people and we trust our people to handle these rates of change, we can accelerate it. So, um, I mean, what we saw from one of the slides is that we deal directly with some of the most innovative or rated most innovative businesses in the world. And, and, and not only around their product, but just how we deploy it and how we use it and how we use our, our people. I mean, we've seen a, a massive change in the mix of our goods and sales and what's being bought. We see PCs being bought, far fewer printers being bought. We see migration to the cloud. These are details. It's more around backing our people to, uh, to, to, to chase this change a hell of a lot faster than we have and, um, and make some calculated uh, risks, take some calculated risks. Yeah. Thanks, Mas. Thanks. Uh, we've got some questions coming through, and some of them are, we're gonna, I'm going to try and group them. Um, there's a question particularly that says, will we get the recording of this? And the questions, um, we will look to answer all the questions today. There will be a recording of this. I'll tell you about that later. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Puerta, uh, just a question. You, you mentioned growth, and uh, I think throughout your presentation, you spoke a lot about potential growth, and one of your slides spoke about uh, potential growth that's between 3 to 4%. That's possible. Um, you also mentioned a lot around probably dropping ideologies to focus on growth. And I think a question that most of us are, uh, have, particularly because there are a lot of, of naysayers in our, in our country, <laughs> in the media, um, what needs to happen now in order for the country, so if you're advising the cabinet or, or the president and you're saying what needs to be in place now for us to see that growth in the next 12 to 18 months? Yes, I must say, I find it frightening that there are, there are people that are being paid more than a million rand a year to make laws in this country, uh, and, and they are, are bickering about uh, a couple of private shareholders in the Reserve Bank, for instance, that have no say whatsoever uh, on, or over the regulatory function or the policy function of the Reserve Bank. At a time when, you know, most people should realize by now that nationalization is a terrible, terrible option and has caused so much grief and, and damage and harm to the global economy in the last uh, century that, that it should be best be avoided. Why the ANC can't just say, okay, well, you know, we spoke about this in December 2017 uh, and so on, but <clears throat> let's just put it in the back burner for a while. Uh, there are people that are hungry in this country. There are people that go to bed hungry. Um, we can, if government goes into a partnership with the agricultural sector and the food processing sector in this country and they allow the private sector to take the lead in this i've got no doubt in my mind that they will they will create a system uh it's been called loosely soup kitchens through also through the involvement of uh, the array the plethora of churches that we have in this country to provide food for every person in this country that doesn't have the means 
to, to feed themselves. We can do this if we really want to. But if we continue bickering about, uh, you know, whether a company needs 20 or 30 percent women shareholder and disability and, and people with whose pigmentation levels are not quite the same. And by the way, uh, there is no such thing in this country as a genetically, uh, you know, uh, pure uh, person. I did the 23 and meat uh, saliva test. It's a NASDAQ company that was uh, initiated by my son who's in Silicon Valley. And I'm 3% Congo Brazzaville. And that's a fact. I mean, you know what sailors do when they, <laughs> when they travel and they go uh, ashore from time to time. So this is just such a stupid um, uh, ideological uh, issue. Just put it on the back burner. What we need sh should do to galvanize all South Africans say, now we're going to grow this economy. We don't care whether you're black or white. Can you create a job? Yes, great stuff. If you create a job, the minute you create a job, and this is very important, the minute you create a job, you broaden the tax base. You broaden the tax base immediately. And Edward Kisveter is laughing all the way to the bank, which is good. So what they need to do is to keep interest rates low, number one, get cracking on the infrastructure side of things, which involves the private sector heavily, which is great stuff. And in NEDLAC now, as we are talking, in the next 10 days, NEDLAC has to provide a plan to, to, to settle Ramaphosa. If Labour does not want to accept the fact that we need to reform labor legislation in this country to make it easier for businesses to employ people. If they don't want to accept that, they must be kicked off the bus. The Tripartite Alliance needs to die as far as I'm concerned, quickly. The, uh, the SA Communist Party and Cusato have not contested elections in this country. The ANC has, and they won fair and square, right? They should decide on policy, not, not, not these, uh, if, if uh, Cusato thinks they've got a better way to run this country uh, into the ground, uh, then let them contest an election. So uh, those are some of the uh, issues that we need to tackle. Uh, I want to preempt a question which I've seen concerning the downgrading. I just want to mention the fact that when Brazil was downgraded uh, more than two years, three years before us, their bond yield declined and the exchange rate strengthened. And if it hadn't been for COVID, the same thing would have happened to us. I'm not worried about the ratings agencies. They don't make their money out of sovereign ratings. They make their money out of rating banks. Um, we need to convince the world that this economy is growing, that if you invest in South Africa, your, your assets will not be nationalized and you can repatriate your dividends. And that's the case right now. And we, we must strengthen those attractions, those competitive indicators, like in our financial sector, our, our IT sector. Uh, I mean, this whole thing about broadband, what the hell is taking them so long? You know, um, we need to get cracking on, on increasing competitiveness. Once again, I'm pinching words from Tito Mbuweni and, and President Ramaphosa, but they must get on with us right now. Uh, everything is, is, is it's clear what we need to do. And I'd like to believe we'll do that. Thanks, Doc. Um, I'm going I'm to ask you another question. Uh, I'll, I'll, I see Michelle Fonseca's asked a question around renewables. I want to tie that question with something that you spoke about around innovation. Uh, we had a slide around the, uh, the companies that are most innov innovative and so on and so forth. And you also mentioned renewables. Um, so maybe in light of renewables and innovation in South Africa, um, what's the, what, what should be done for, for growth in, in innovation in South Africa? Um, and maybe answer that in, in light of also um, uh, uh, IPPs as well. What, what needs to be done for, for, for that to grow um, uh, and, and, and become a pillar of our economy? You know, I'm, I'm very concerned about the whole issue of nuclear. Uh, a third of our municipalities are bankrupt. They're dysfunctional. Uh, in the Northwest, uh, I had the dubious honor of driving, driving through Brits, Madi Beng, uh, on a weekly basis. I mean, the stench from the sewage works that have been gone to pot about a decade ago already, the potholes, I mean, this is just unbelievable. Uh, you, you have to drive on the side of the road. If, if these guys can't even fix a pothole, how the hell are they going to get involved in managing nuclear power? We don't need nuclear in this country. And I was, I was absolutely shocked to see that this is on the agenda again. Uh, the, the costs of solar and, and wind in, has, has declined by such a margin that it is so obvious to, to anybody out there that understands the economics of energy and international protocols that we have to adhere to and the safety issues surrounding nuclear, that we should just go all out for solar and, and, and wind. Um, and we can do that. I mean, as, as Miles has said, uh, what has happened now, there's an interesting 
uh, adage which says he who hesitates is lost, he or she, obviously. Um, and I wouldn't go that far. But the fact is, as I mentioned, the fourth industrial revolution has been thrust upon us. So, uh, and one must proceed with some measure of caution, I suppose. But certainly, as Miles has said, uh, many companies have now been forced to implement changes that would only have occurred uh, 6, 12, 18 months down the line. We don't have choices anymore. We must get in touch with them pronto. And government must follow suit. Government must certainly follow suit as far as that's concerned. Thanks, Doc. Uh, Miles, just following on that, uh, on the innovation part, um, uh, maybe sp speak specifically to, to our industry. You kind of touched on it in, in your earlier uh, comment. W what, what do we need to do? Um, and let's maybe speak on an industry perspective in order to increase innovation, which, which, which we believe that will, will, will then mean jobs are created. Therefore, the, as the doc said, then the tax base increases and so on and so forth. What, what are the things that, that you in your space, you are seeing or you would recommend or you're seeing at Tarsus now as, as the person, as the captain of the ship, uh, that you would say to, to those maybe who are, who are listening, who are in the industry, say, these are the things that we recommend you do and, and, and in order to drive innovation and growth. So, since the, I think... Innovation comes from human beings, mm -hmm. and it comes from imagination, and it comes from um, trial and error. Um, so, so to harness innovation, you have to let people go. You have to trust people to get on with it. So organizations that have historically governed themselves in a very centralized way, in a very command and control and structured way, are stifling innovation. And innovation, one of the things that we have achieved and, and grown in confidence over this lockdown period um, ourselves at Tarsus is we've just seen how our people have risen to the occasion. We've just seen how fast we've had to implement. I mean, Doc Boto mentions, you know, the, it's, it's accelerated the fourth industrial revolution. And, and maybe just in a more practical, down-to-earth, day-to-day um, environment like we've had to get going every day when we confront it with a different challenge. It's, I mean, I'm certainly not the one in Tarsus with the ideas. In fact, I'm usually the very last person to have the ideas. It's more a question of refining our listening skills and bringing them in and letting people try things and do things and suggest things and creating that culture. There's just something else I want to, to say coming out of this lockdown. And I was, I was listening to uh, um, the radio yesterday, driving home from the studio, actually. And it was, they were interviewing the lady um, who is the chief executive of the Restaurants Association. And they were talking about this fake news that we had recently about the government unilaterally closing down the liquor again and banning liquor sales and so on and the damage that that did. And she was explaining. And she was, was just saying how the channels of communication between government and their association have been massively improved and how they now have the ability to talk to the right ministry and get reliable information now back from government. So I think a lot of these mistakes that have been made through COVID and the lockdown and some of the massive embarrassment like Ibrahim Patil closing down um, you know, e-commerce uh, as one of these regulations and some of the embarrassing regulations that have come. I do believe that some of the smarter people in government have experienced this embarrassment. It's hard to know um, just how embarrassed some of them do get sometimes. Um, but but the, the, the channels of communication that have opened, um, you know, just in whole collaboration between public and private health, the ability and just the, the, the fast tracking of the fast tracking of the ability to get the medical aid schemes, for example, to collate the costs from private sector to come to a 17,000 Rand per day fee um, for, to be charged to public sector for use of private. Um, you know, that, that, that is massive. I, you know, I, th I think that a lot of people don't realize how massive that is and how complex it was and how quickly it was achieved and, and how that lays the foundations for future communication. So I, I sit and I hear Doc Boerter say government needs to do this, government needs to do that. And, and, and my own prior pessimism prior to lockdown was, well, you know, they need to do this, but are they going to? Because we keep hearing, you know, sometimes quite moronic things coming out of it. Um, 
But I think that we need to use these channels now. We as business must now start to engage formally and respectfully with government and vice versa. And I believe we can go and um, um, get these channels to work. And, and that's also then when the innovation will come through. It's only when, when, when there is some kind of policy certainty, some kind of sensible policy that, that enables it and the will to invest will come. So, so I, you know, I, I'm very optimistic about the improved communications and we need to take that now and maintain it. Thanks, Miles. Doc, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, just a, 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 a parting shot on, on, on today and looking ahead. Any, any further thoughts you'd like to share with, with the audience before we wrap up? Well, <clears throat> I'd like them to, to heed uh, what Miles has just said. I mean, I agree with him 100%. To govern well, you must govern little. This is an adage that has become uh, you know, a very long way. Um, and, and, and certainly uh, things happen a lot more slowly in government. The fact is that if you look at the achievements of people like Leibniz, Schweitzer, uh, all of the major industrial technological achievements of the last 100 years, none, not one single one of these occurred as a result of a governmental directive. These were individual acts of genius in societies where, that permit diversity. Uh, and, and we still have that in South Africa, but government must let loose. They must, you know, start forgetting about this, this control, uh, you know, issue. And if they really think the ANC is more important than South Africa, then, then people in the ANC that say that, we should get rid of those people. This country has an incredible future ahead of us. I just want to mention that HP is one of only seven companies, one of only seven that have been in the top 50 most innovative companies in the world since the inception of this survey in 1955. Obviously, it depends when a company was included. And the returns on that innovation have been spectacular. So uh, quite frankly, a government has a hell of a lot to gain by working closer with the private sector, by working, working closer with companies like Tarsus to, to advise them. How, what, 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 how should we change the, leg, the legislation, the regulations? In which way can we change that so that you guys and girls can create more jobs? Then you create a win-win situation. And at least now we have a pretty smart president, which is an improvement. Thank you. Doc, thank you so much. We could spend uh, a whole another hour just chatting. Um, I see the questions, uh, the questions around pension funds, the questions about around renewable energies, the questions about potential growth in, in particular sectors. Um, I wanna just say uh, thank you to you, Miles, for, for, for for sitting in. Thank you, Doc, for sharing your insights and your generosity with your time as well as, well as just your knowledge. Uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. We really do appreciate you joining in. Please look out for an email coming through in your inbox in the next couple of days. And when I say a couple of days, I don't mean um, an English couple, I mean a South African couple. Look out for an email in a couple of days. Um, you can, uh, it, will, it, will, it, will, it will also be up on our website in the next couple of days. We will, um, we will look to answer all the questions that, are, that have popped up now that we didn't get to today. And we'll also tell you more about the next webinar that we'll be hosting in October. Um, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, have a wonderful Thursday. Keep safe and keep healthy. Cheers.